And so I'm very happy to be here and uh, many thanks to Professor Mohammed and to Dr. Amr for this uh, great opportunity to share some information about the extracorporeal life support in thoracic surgery in general. Um, I'm, I'm going to be um, giving a brief history of the extracorporeal life support, talking about the concepts and the cannulation and the classical indications of the ECLS being means of uh, bridge to lung transplantation, but also, as Professor Mohammed uh, previously mentioned, um, as bridge to other surgeries or as support during other thoracic surgical um, procedures. So um, um, I really like to talk about history because it's uh, it's always uh, inspiring to see how the pioneers of these um, fields has um, has begun. So this is the this is the young Dr. John Gibbon uh, and his wife. John Gibbon was um, a surgical resident in Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital, and uh, during during um, his his night shift, as he was a 26 year old uh, resident, he treated a a young um, lady suffering from a massive pulmonary uh, embolism and he he wrote uh, these notes on his uh, on his uh, notebook so uh, that that might be also considered as the birth hour of the uh, of the extracorporeal life support so uh, john gibbon describes the the clinical uh, crisis of uh, of uh, the pulmonary embolism and and also the the possible um, the possible treatment of it so as he says the idea and it truly occurred to me that if we were possible to remove continuously some of the blood, blue blood from the patient's swollen veins, put oxygen into that blood and allow carbon dioxide to escape from it, and then to inject continuously the now red blood back to the patient's arteries, we might have saved her life. So uh, this is this is ECMO. This is what we, we now uh, use uh, daily at uh, several indications. And uh, it, it's been also uh, a great success afterwards. At 1930, uh, 1953, he's, he actually implanted the first mechanical life support as a heart lung machine, which was really a bulky um, machine at that time for a, a cardiac surgery, which was a, a septum uh, defect. Um, a few years later, Rashkin and his, his co-workers um, implanted the first bubble oxygenator. This is really also a large console uh, compared to the ones we have uh, currently for the ECMO therapy. So at that time, it was, it was uh, always the field of uh, neonates suffering from uh, respiratory failure, and uh, uh, 1972 was the first successful ECMO implantation as we know it from Robert Bartlett, which also might be seen as the father of the modern um, ECMO therapy. And um, all of these um, efforts has, has led actually to the um, to the concept of extracorporeal life support as we know it today. So um, as I say, it's, it's actually the extracorporeal life support. Why I say that? Because it comprises many uh, modes of, uh, of action, many, um, many, many means of ECLS. So we got the ECMO, which is the exocorporeal membrane explanation. We got the AFCOR, which is the arteriovenous uh, carbon dioxide uh, removal. In this case, it's a pumpless device, which I'm going to be coming to in a few uh, slides. And we have the exocorporeal uh, carbon dioxide removal, uh, which is pump driven in this case. So um, when we're looking at the um, ECLS, means we always have many indications and many um, and many uh, reasons why we would uh, actually use that. So I'm concentrating on the respiratory part of that. So um, if, if we need to replace the, the entire um, respiratory function, uh, including oxygenation and CO2 removal, uh, we're always at the, at the high flow setting, um, either in a veno arterial or veno venous fashion. Um, and high um, high flow um, setting is always um, above 60% of the patient's cardiac output. So if I need to replace the whole uh, function, I need to be in the high flow uh, level. And if I only need uh, to remove the carbon dioxide, so I will go to the low flow um, um, ECMO setting, either by this extracorporeal CO2 removal, by dual or single side cannulation, as I'm going to say in a few slides, or by the pumpless device which is sort of an arteriovenous shunt. So um, a very uh, important aspect of uh, the ECMO circuit is to understand actually what you're doing with the ECMO circuit. So um, we can only uh, change two, uh, two things and adjust two things on the whole ECMO setting. I can adjust the uh, sweep gas flow, which is the oxygen coming to the circuit from either my, uh, my gas blender or from, from the wall extension. Um, and I can change um, the rounds per minute in which the pump is, is circulating and indirectly change the blood flow. So um, if, if we're needing the oxygenation, 
the main determinant of uh, oxygenation is actually the blood flow. So many people might uh, falsely think if I increase the oxygen, I'm going to get more oxygenation, which is not the case. It's actually uh, the blood flow, which really um, leads to the oxygenation. So um, Robert Bartlett um, um, is, is a really uh, great innovative guy. I had the honor of meeting him at a convention once, and, um, and he always says you cannot make flow, you always get the flow. So it's a, it's a product of, of several things. Um, it's the product of site, of the canalization site, of the, can of, of the cannula size, of the placement of the cannula, of the patient's hemoglobin, and um, of the of the intravasal uh, volume. So um, if I choose two small cannulas, I'm not going to be able to get a good flow, a blood flow, and and uh, subsequently I'm not going to get a good oxygenation. And if I place them wrong, and uh, if I if I don't check that well, I'm not going to get a good blood flow. So making sure that all these determinants are are uh, okay is really mandatory to have a a sufficient blood flow, and then a sufficient ECMO oxygenation. Uh, speaking of, of carbon dioxide removal, it's really efficient. In all these modern membranes, um, you got a really good CO2 removal function. It, it, it depends actually, in this case, on the sweep gas flow, on the, on the oxygen I'm offering the system. So uh, the more oxygen I give the system, the better CO2 removal I get. So that if, if you get that in mind, um, you're going to be able to handle um, ECMO very, very well. And of course, the total surface of your artificial lung is the other determinant, but um, as I say, and as we're going to see in a few slides, um, you don't need that much of a flow to re actually remove the CO2. So um, when we're start starting of the veno arterial ECMO, which is uh, like the most common uh, used form historically, because uh, we are starting also to get minimally invasive and, and means of ECMO, uh, the blood is, is uh, drawn from the venous system and return to the arterial system. And of course, oxycorporeal, we got the oxygenation, we got the CO2 removal. It provides the partial or a complete hemodynamic and or respiratory support and replacement. Um, the main indication is actually the cardiac failure with, um, with concomitant uh, pulmonary failure, which is actually always uh, a result almost uh, due to the pulmonary congestion after a myocardial failure. And in this case, the systemic Hyperionization is mandatory. So uh, this is just uh, a figure to show the cannulation. It might be performed percutaneously, but also um, surgically. You, you put the draining cannula in the vena, in the, in the uh, femoral vein, and the returning cannula in the arteria. So it might be um, performed on the same side or commonly actually on two sides. Right, you get the vein, and left, you get the artery. Um, a better way to cannulate the artery would be the subclavian um, artery because uh, in this case, you get an anti-grade uh, flow. Um, in the classical um, femoral femoral uh, setting, you got a retrograde flow, and uh, that leads to this uh, called watershed phenomenon. So um, the blood meets from the poorly oxygenated patient's blood, since he got, he's got this failure, and from the good and uh, enriched um, uh, oxygen blood from the ECMO circuit, and they, they almost meet at the level of the renal uh, vessels. So this is called the watershed zone. And um, after that, the blood mixes and uh, the blood uh, actually uh, coming to the heart and to the brain is not that well oxygenated. So to overcome this problem, it's going to be better and more physiological actually to cannulate the subclavian artery um, mainly over a, over a small uh, prothesis which you put on the subclavian artery and then uh, place your cannula. In. Of course, it's not always possible because in the in the means of uh, emergency uh, scenario, you're not going to be able to quickly cannulate the subclavian artery. So you begin with the femoral femoral setting, and after uh, stabilizing the patient, you move, um, if possible, to the subclavian um, setting. Um, in the venovenous ECMO, you got the whole system in the venous uh, on the venous side. So you got the draining and the returning cannula. By, uh, both on the uh, venous side and got a high flow or a, a low flow setting, depending on the type of lung failure. And it, it would also enable a protective ventilation in patients suffering from uh, IRDS, for example. So um, the main indication is actually the hypoxic respiratory failure, um, giving the hemodynamic stability of the patient. Um, the oxygenation support is not that good as in the veno arterial um, setting, but it is sufficient. Actually, you're going to see that um, in the in the cases I'm going to show you afterwards. Um, and also here, since the, it's a high flow setting, the hyperionization is mandatory. Here is the scheme showing um, how it's actually placed. You got the commonly actually always on the right side, uh, the femoral vein, which is cannulated 
um, depending, of course, on the on, on the uh, body size and uh, weight. Um, you take a 23 uh, or 21 or 25 French, and you always got four French difference to the um, uh, returning Canada. So if I go for a 23 French on the uh, femoral vein, I would place a 19 French on the um, on the jugular vein, which is most commonly in, in all um, in all adults, a very good setting. Of course, if possible, you always perform a uh, sonography before um, placing the cannula. And if the vessels are large enough, go for larger uh, cannulas. The larger the cannula, the better the flow. So go for a 25, 21 setting. It's also okay. And the draining cannula and the, and the um, ephemeral vein, um, it takes out the blood uh, by the pump. And uh, as you can see, you can, you can just uh, adjust the rounds per minute on your console. This is your oxygenator, and it, it, it becomes um, um, oxygen from the gas blender or from the wall. So if you got a gas blender, it's 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 actually better because you can control the fraction of uh, of oxygen um, entering the circuit after it's enriched with um, oxygen and um, freed from con uh, carbon dioxide. It's returned to the right atrium and afterwards to the um, uh, systemic circulation of the patient. So um, this is just. Um, an example how it's cannulated. I'm going to show a video at the end of the uh, lecture to show that it's it's really a simple uh, uh, Zellinger technique. If you um, make sure that some some things are going well, it's it's always almost always uh, without any complications. If you just take care of some some key points, which I'm going to return to uh, while uh, commenting the video. You may also um, maintain or uh, gain a, a full support, full venovenous ECMO support by, by inserting only one cannula into the jugular vein. Uh, this is called the Avalon uh, cannula. And um, it has, as you see, um, uh, several draining um, openings, uh, mainly on the inferior and superior vena cava. And the returning uh, uh, opening is, is always on the, uh, in the, in the right atrium. But in this case, you always need to perform a trans esophageal echocardiographical uh, control of the of the position of this cannula, and um, this is actually also the, the disadvantage of this cannula. So it's really it's really uh, advantages from one uh, term that you get only one side cannulation, and it's it's really um, it's it's really easy to place. But of course, to maintain uh, the same position while mobilizing the patient, because patients are also walking with such cannula in the best case, um, uh, the dislocation of the cannula is really high. So um, this is the only disadvantage, actually, of this of this uh, otherwise very good cannula. Um, AFCOR, or as many know it as the interventional lung assist, ELA, for example, um, is the removal of the carbon dioxide by an arteriovenous shunt, which is pumpless, of course. You use the the, the body use the heart as your pump. Uh, so it's been uh, developed by the German uh, company Novalank at 2002, and they developed these low resistance membranes allowing for really efficient uh, carbon dioxide removal. So um, the, the gas exchange membrane um, acts just like an arterial venous shunt, and uh, the carbon dioxide removal is, is determined by the, the sweep gas flow, which can uh, come up to uh, 12 liters per minute, allowing for really sufficient um, uh, carbon dioxide removal. Um, in this case, the systemic heparinization is recommended, but it's not mandatory because you got you got low flows. Um, you got about like one liter or, um, or or less sometimes. So it's not mandatory, but it's it's just recommended. Uh, here you can see the figure showing this the setting. You got uh, you got the um, arterial cannula here on the on the, on the left side and the venous um, returning cannula on the right side. And um, as you can see, you got the oxygenator. You got your your uh, sweep gas line, and um, as it uh, indicates here, um, flows about 500 milliliters until two liters are um, are possible. But you don't need that much. I mean, one liter is really sufficient. Um, and in this case, um, of course, um, what is what is important? This is just to show it again in a, in a patient how you place that. This is your um, uh, your flow measurement um, instrument, and um, uh, the patient need to have. Um, a stable uh, hemodynamics uh, st um, um, situation. And uh, in many patients, you actually um, need some uh, catecholamine uh, support to maintain um, uh, the shunt, actually. So um, there, is, there is always some increase in the cardiac output driven by uh, medication, of course, um, but it's, it's, it's not that large um, uh, dosage you need in the patients if they are hemodynamically stable, of course. Um, one possible complication is actually uh, due to the um, arterial uh, side uh, cannulation. So uh, 
we got uh, we got in the in the arterial setting some uh, limb ischemia compartment syndrome uh, bleeding during uh, cannulation or cannula thrombosis. This is common in arterial and in, 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 in the vein, but uh, these limb ischemias are actually also uh, seen. You can overcome this problem by inserting one cannula in an anti-grade uh, fashion to uh, perfuse the cannulated um, limb, the cannulated leg. Uh, but generally you get some, sometimes you get some uh, complications due to the to the arterial cannulation. Regarding the venous side, you get the cannula thrombosis, you got some uh, thrombosis of the exchange membrane, and of course a pump malfunction because it's still a technique and sometimes a technique uh, might fail. Um, our, our colleagues from uh, Regensburg here in Germany um, would give every patient on an extracorporeal life support system um, aspirin actually daily to uh, avoid, for example, the thrombosis of the exchange membrane. <clears throat> I do it myself. Uh, we also give um, agatoban and not heparin uh, usually when we're using ACLS because we have seen that the uh, rate of, uh, of such complications is a is lot um, um, less when you, you go for um, agatoban as um, uh, heparin. Another means of, um, of uh, carbon dioxide elimination is this extracorporeal carbon dioxide elimination by the uh, twin port single side cannula which is in this case a pump-driven uh, device, and it does not depend on the patient's uh, cardiac output to generate the pressure gradient. Um, in this case, you have a higher uh, inflammatory response uh, due to the driven, um, uh, the pump-driven nature. So um, th that would be only one cannula, this uh, twin port cannula, and it drains and returns the blood on the same side. And this is how it looks like. You get a lot of uh, openings on both sides of the cannula, which uh, drain the blood and the tip of the cannula returns blood again. The advantage is you do not need any uh, echocardiographic control, and you can insert the cannula either um, jugularly or femorally, and um, it, it's really easy to insert. So it's just one cannula, you insert that, and afterwards uh, the system runs. Um, it's, it's really efficient. Um, you, you got flow rates of a half to one liter, and um, the, the sweep gas flow is, is usually way under eight liters, not like the AFCOR up to 12 liters. So you really can efficiently remove the CO2 by using this um, uh, this method. One very interesting uh, method for the lung transplantation is the paracorporeal oxygenation. So this is uh, for patients with severe pulmonary hypertension and still uh, somehow compensated uh, hemodynamic uh, situation. So there are two cannulas implanted surgically. The first cannula is the draining cannula, which is implanted to the uh, pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery. And the returning cannula is implanted to the left atrium. So you got the same constellation as the arterial venous um, CO2 removal on the femoral sides, but in this case for um, oxygenation, because um, the patients have uh, suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension. And um, in this case, you just get the gradient by, by this pulmonary hypertension. But of course, you need to do that surgically. You can't do that percutaneously, still not. Um, and you get a complete respiratory support. This is the diagram shown yet. So you got you got your cannula into the main uh, pulmonary artery. This is the draining cannula. And uh, you got the returning cannula into the left atrium and the membrane between that. And as you can see, you get the sweep gas flow. And, uh, and by this means, you can actually uh, provide a full support of the respiratory situation. So when we... Um, Take a look at this diagram. It's, it's only there to show you that the the process of um, extracorporeal life support is a very dy dynamic one. So um, and you, you might want to um, evaluate and reevaluate this process uh, several times a day and anyways every day because when you have a patient which is unstable or which you where you consider going for an extracorporeal uh, life support device, um, it is just like uh, a sepsis therapy because when you get a patient with sepsis, you go for the broad spectrum antibiotic and afterwards you de-escalate and the same applies for ECMO. So um, if I get a patient and, and I'm not quite sure what to take, go for a higher uh, level, go for a higher um, level of support and you can always de-escalate. And, and you can also have some other combinations just like a veno veno arterial setting. You can drain from the femoral vein on the right side and return to the your jugular um, vein and to the subclavian artery, for example. So having a patient with a, a right heart failure and a concomitant uh, a lung failure, that would be a very nice setting. And you could always reduce your cannula or you can always, of course, if it's too, um, uh, if it's not sufficient, also escalate your, your setting. So you really should, um, you really should, uh, you should um, consider the ECMO therapy as as a uh, as a dynamic process. It's not a static; it's a dynamic process. Um, 
now we're talking about the indications of uh, of the ECLS. So the really classical indication in thoracic surgery is the bridge to lung uh, transplantation and also the transplant itself. So for those of us who performed the uh, lung transplant, we know that we previously actually always, uh, almost always, have used the cardiopulmonary bypass to to perform that. So uh, sometime uh, around the 2000 and you know uh, beginning from the 2000s, um, there has been some some attempts to to minimize uh, the surgical trauma during transplantation and 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 then uh, ECMO uh, veno arterial ECMO for example was um, the one thing you do uh, and even also in a percutaneous uh, fashion for example we also performed some transplants uh, without any uh, means of support by two anterior uh, placed uh, thoracotomies you can do that as well but I mean the ECMO support is is really a safe and and a good uh, mode of supporting the patients since you got a lot of patients also on the waiting list which deteriorate which need an ECLS so in this case you just know all right I'm going to place this ECLS and probably also uh, use that during my transplant so uh, there's a really nice uh, review by Patterson and colleagues which is also uh, quite uh, recent um, showing this this algorithm how to choose the right uh, mode for the right patient so if you got a patient without any hemodynamic compromise. Um, if it's only a hypercapnic failure, you might just go for a, uh, an extracorporeal uh, CO2 removal by a low flow setting or even um, a venovenous ECMO. So one of, one of, one of the both. And um, in this case, you can go for a pumpless device as well. So it's also been described previously that you can transplant using this um, device if the patient is in a uh, stable and only has a, a, a separate and isolated hypercapnic failure. So if the patient has a hypoxic failure, you have to take the high flow venovenous setting by two side cannulation. Hemodynamic compromise or hemodynamic failure is, is present. So uh, you need to go for a veno arterial ECMO. And um, um, as I, as I um, previously mentioned, if you got only an isolated right ventricular failure due to the presence of the pulmonary hypertension, you might consider the paracorporeal uh, oxygenation I just showed you by cannulating the main artery and the left atrium. If you got a, a general uh, or generalized um, uh, cardiac failure, so you go for a venal arterial ECMO. So as you can see in this, in this recent uh, study, there is almost no place for cardiac pulmonary bypass. So you, you can really perform the, the LTX nicely by uh, using the ECMO and you have a way much uh, less uh, uh, inflammatory response after the ECMO rather than compared to the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So it's um, so it is really getting a little minimally invasive as everything else in surgery. And uh, it is really also nice and, um, and really easy to apply. One other indication is also a bridge to the lung volume transplant surgery, um, a reduction surgery, I'm sorry. So um, I'm gonna be presenting some, some cases in the previous years. Um, uh, this is a case of a, of a, of a 58 uh, year old uh, male patient um, with, with known um, uh, COPD stage four um, with, with, with the really um, uh, deteriorating uh, lung function and end stage lung emphysema. So the patient was actually evaluated for, uh, for endoscopic volume and lung volume reduction, but, but, but it was not possible because uh, collateral ventilation was was present, and the patient did perform intermittent um, non-invasive uh, ventilation for up to 16 hours daily, and uh, had a long-term um, oxygen therapy with six to eight liters per minute. So the patient admi um, was admitted to our um, department uh, that was that was uh, about nine years ago with severe hypercapnia and uh, and also acidosis. There was an acute respiratory pump failure with increasing dyspnea and marked uh, muscle fatigue. There, there was no acute infection. Um, and, and despite NIF and also almost normalizing um, the, the carbon dioxide, um, dyspnea and, and anxiety persisted. So we, we took a look at the patient and we thought, all right, we, we're gonna take him on, on ECLS. We're gonna, we're gonna place um, a twin port cannula Femorally, because you can get a little bit more flow there, like about two to two to five, uh, two point five liters, and perhaps get some oxygenation as well. But his his main problem was the hypercapnic uh, failure. So we inserted the twin port cannula uh, into the femoral uh, vein, and and after after that dyspnea and anxiety uh, really diminished, and the patient was able to communicate with us with his family. So uh, we talked to him, and, and and we told him, all right, we're going to perform a, a, a CT scan. And uh, we did that as well. And we have seen that the, that the right upper lobe was almost uh, destroyed due to this um, uh, emphysematous um, 
lung and and uh, there was a severe antithoracic uh, hyperinflation and flattening of the diaphragm so you can take a look at this uh, destroyed right upper lobe here with the uh, with, with a lot of uh, buddha's emphysema and uh, also the flattened um, diaphragm so we talked to him really thoroughly and and uh we we, we told him that we would take out the uh, right upper lobe because it's, it's it's destroyed anyways uh in a mean of of lung volume reduction surgery so we performed that in a in the vats uh, lobectomy and also resected some uh, bulla of segment uh, six. The patient was extubated on the operating room with the running uh, ECMO circuit. <clears throat> and he was also able to perform intensive physiotherapy and respiratory training on the ongoing um, uh, ECMO circuit. And we removed that on the second post-operative day. Um, there was really a substantial improvement of the, of the breathing pump of the patient afterwards and the exercise capacity. It was a charge on day 21. And this is the this is the actual patient with our respiratory thera uh, therapist at that time, showing his his normal um, um, hypercapnia actually, which which is well tolerated by him. But he, he didn't have any anxiety and he didn't have any dyspnea afterwards. So uh, you might consider uh, um, this form of of support in patients actually deteriorating with their emphysema, which have an indication for surgery uh, to be a bridge to surgery and throughout the surgery. Another one. Another example um, uh, is a patient with a giant uh, bullet. It was a young patient, a 48 um, uh, male patient with also a COPD gold uh, four. He had a he had a very um, poor lung function at that time and uh, hyperinflation and a severe gas defect with a diffusion capacity of uh, of about 30 percent. Um, almost um, a, a, a chronic hyper, um, hypocops, uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure on, um, on room air. So um, in the CD scan, which I will just show you straight ahead, showed this giant bulla like um, um, occupying almost the half of, 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 of his thorax and uh, a marked shift of the mediastinum to the left side and a flattening of the diaphragm. So we, we, we talked to him and we told him that we're going to perform the bullectomy. But of course, when I mean, you take a look at this lung, and uh, <clears throat> taking an account that during our surgery we're going to be needing a single lung ventilation of the left lung, and the left lung is not that uh, it's not that healthy as you can see. So uh, to avoid uh, applying really high pressures of the mechanical ventilation, and of course avoid the barotraumatic um, uh, sequelae of, of this mechanical ventilation, we have uh, spoken to him and told him, all right, probably we're going to perform this surgery uh, using an extracorporeal uh, uh, lung support device. In this case. Uh, for hypercapnic failure, as I'm going to show you. So um, that was the intraoperative um, figure showing this giant bullet, which was rejected by, by VATS. And here is the uh, blood gas analysis uh, course during surgery. So after the intubation, we, we started single lung ventilation of the left lung, and we have, we have seen that, um, that a marked uh, hypercapnia occurred. So then um, we planted <clears throat> also in this case uh, a twin port cannula into the right uh, femoral vein and 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 straightforward the hypercapnia uh, diminished and and we had a, a sufficient oxygenation and a really good uh, carbon uh, dioxide removal throughout um, the whole surgery and 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 afterwards the patient was also extubated in the operating room and we kept the extracorporeal life support for one day after extubating just to give him a good chance it was removed and the patient was discharged in very good condition afterwards and with an improved uh, pulmonary function. One other good example is performing surgery in patients with previous pneumonectomy. So uh, in this case, we had uh, a 69-year-old patient, which was uh, pneumonectomized on the right side. And uh, during a CT scan, uh, there was a new newly diagnosed lesion on the left lower lobe, segment eight. Um, so he was pneumonectomized uh, five years before due to a central uh, thromboscale cell carcinoma. And now he got this this new lesion in the in the um, left lower lobe. So um, after discussing all the possible uh, options, um, we actually went for um, resecting this um, uh, this this tumor. And we also here you can see the CT scan, the speculae of this uh, lesion on the on the left lower lobe. Um, in this case, we also. Um, uh, performed a, um, a single side cannulation of this twin port cannula and, and used the um, 
the apneic oxygenation phenomenon. So um, you can still get some oxygenation by uh, insufflating some uh, some oxygen to the to the uh, atelectatic lung, and and that was really uh, nice to see because. Um, on that time, you can see it's, it was a thoracotomy. So uh, nowadays, we're going to perform a uniportal uh, VATS, but that was eight years ago. So uh, we hadn't that uh, we hadn't got that great practice on uh, on segmentectomies on such segmentectomies, uh, segment eight, for example. So it was a thoracotomy we performed at that time, um, a limited one actually. And uh, afterwards, you can see that we actually had like forty five minutes of apnea only by inserting a twin-port cannula and applying some apneic oxygenation. So that was sufficient time to take out the segment and the lymph nodes. And afterwards, chest was closed. And actually, we removed the ECMO straight ahead after surgery because it was only, it was only a functional <clears throat> um, um, indication. And um, the patient's uh, course was um, uneventful, and, and he was able to be discharged. Of course, I mean, he's a, he's a, um, he, he got a lot of multimorbidities. That's why 21 uh, days. But... Uh, um, he, he really had a good and um, uneventful um, post-operative course. Um, another interesting case was a patient after performing uh, or after receiving a lung transplant due to um, uh, fibrosis. So in the case of fibrosis, one might transplant only one lung. And this is, was, this is also uh, the, the case in this patient. He, he received a left-sided single lung consultation to pulmonary fibrosis. A um, few years uh, before, or, or a few years um, after, actually, he had the squamous cell carcinoma of the urinary bladder and received a surgical therapy. And now um, he had four pulmonary masses um, showing um, an increased activity in the PET-CT scan in the graft lung. So that was actually uh, a lot of bad luck for this patient. Um, and as you can see here, this is uh, this is the, the right um, lung, the right fibrotic lung of the patient, which was not transplanted uh, at that time. And this is the graft he received a few years um, before with these metastatic lesions. And if you can, uh, if you take a look at the at the ventilation perfusion uh, scan, you, you can see that the right lung is actually not functioning. So it is also here a, a functional pneumonectomy the patient has. But in this case, we we decided to insert uh, a full support, uh, a venovenous support in a high um, in a high uh, um, uh, flow um, in a high flow uh, um, fashion to um, uh, enable optimal atelectasis of uh, of the lung and of course uh, to let us really uh, palpate the whole lung and take out the the lesions and that's what we have done so um, we have um, we have um, this multi multidisciplinary discussion and uh, went for resecting them venous venous ECMO in, in a high flow fashion and we had uh, 43 uh, 53 minutes of apnea where we could really palpate the lung well and um, take out all the lesions by by extended wet resections and and lift actually so uh, everything went well and uh, here you can see the intraoperative um, blood gas analysis um, of the patient and uh, we always had some uh, we had really sufficient uh, blood gas analysis by using this ECLS um, everything went well and uh, the patient was also then discharged for further rehabilitation. The last one I'm showing is um, is a functional um, um, indication as well as an extended resection. So we know that in coronal resection, uh, you might go for um, um, uh, for cross field ventilation or for um, um, for um, uh, jet ventilation. In this case, we decided to go for ECMO um, uh, because it's really convenient and and uh, you don't have any lines in your anastomotic um, side. So uh, it's really for convenience, actually. <laughs> and um, uh, this patient had the had the left central uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and we went for. Uh, a transternal coronal pneumonectomy. So uh, previously, we inserted just the venous cannula, draining cannula into the right femoral vein, and the arterial one was inserted open surgically because we were there, just in front of the heart. So we inserted that in the right atrium. So here you can see the CT scan of the central, uh, centrally located tumor, and this is the arterial cannula we inserted um, to the uh, right atrium, and this is exactly the pic showing uh, a very relaxed uh, um, anesthesiological colleague, which is really important for the operation because they must be, they must be really uh, relaxed during surgery for us to be relaxed as well. And um, yeah, everything uh, was also really um, uneventful and, and went very well in this patient. So um, the last I'm showing is, is the video before ending my talk. It's, it's really only a, a, a Zellinger technique um, insertion of, of the cannula. So um, here you see the vein, I mean, this is also a really nice uh, case to see. It's a really skinny patient. And the most uh, important thing is to make sure that your wire 
is is going uh, really uh, without any resistance. So once you, you you have any resistance, just cut it off and go for another function. Do, do not force it. So uh, if it's going smoothly, uh, you're not doing anything wrong. And uh, one very important aspect is to always think about um, about um, removing the wire a few centimeters while entering your vessel dilator, because um, if you enter the vessel dilator and do not um, um, retrieve and and um, remove your uh, wire for a few centimeters, you're gonna get a, a a small kink in the in the wire, and this is 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 the source of a lot of problems. So uh, avoid that by just pulling your 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 wire for like one or two centimeters in the moment you insert your dilator. So uh, uh, there are usually four dilators until 18 French, and and here you see the one assisting is just exactly um, pulling the wire a little bit uh, away while inserting, and then you make sure that your wire is, is going smoothly. So then you know everything is going well. It's, you're not gonna have complications. Um, and after inserting all, all four dilators, um, you get your cannula, as you can see, and there is, um, there is this pot, like about five centimeters where the cannula meets this wire, and you always have the, the feeling that you get this resistance. This is okay, uh, just push it. Uh, <laughs> This is the only one thing I tell my my trainees: don't be, don't worry. You, you did everything right. So if you get this resistance, just go for it. It's it's, it's all normal. Uh, if you've done everything before really smoothly, so this is not a problem because this is usual to have this resistance. It's it's just this one spot, and uh, yeah, as you can see, everything is removed, and it is really the venous blood. Um, so then we flush with some um, with some uh, um, water, and afterwards, at the same time, simultaneously. Um, the jugulary vein is also cannulated, and then you connect um, your cannula bubble-free, just as we know from the cardiac surgery, and um, afterwards you you start your, your ECMO circuit, and, and um, if you really um, paid attention to all these pitfalls, um, it's, it's not going to be a problem at all. Um, yeah, so that brings me actually to my summary. Um, the extrapulmonary gas exchange has successfully been established and is now a clinically accepted and uh, lung protective procedure. The innovative device uh, solutions enable therapies for lung failure that are uh, adapted to specific indications and uh, patients. The duration and intensity of the exopulmonary support are based on individual uh, needs and are also dynamic. You always need to evaluate that. And um, the CO2 removal really requires uh, lower blood flows compared to the oxygenation. And I'm going to end the talk with a quote of, uh, of uh, my most respected uh, uh, Bob Bartlett. Uh, so as you can see, he, he, he tells us a very nice uh, quote, the most useful part of this research. So there it is. The most useful part of uh, all this research has not been to save thousands of patients, but uh, the things we've learned about acute lung failure and acute heart failure that we now apply earlier to those patients. So our most successful patients are the ones who are referred to us for ECMO, Will get better without it. So um, ECMO is, is nice, but without it, is, it's, it's even better. And with that, I come to my end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bassam. Uh, very, very, very nice uh, presentation. And I think uh, all of us uh, enjoyed it and uh, learned from it. Very nice description of the extracorporeal life support. A very nice description to the bridge to lung transplant in different scenarios the cases of bridge to lung volume reduction surgery and the case of surgery for lung volume reduction surgery on uh, extracorporeal life uh, support. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, all of that. First, I would like to uh, ask you a couple of questions and then I will open uh, the uh, door for my colleagues to, uh, to discuss. When we uh, talked about the watershed uh, phenomenon leading to the uh, Harlequin syndrome or the differential hypoxia, hmm. You mentioned uh, by uh, that uh, the, the the solution for that is inserting uh, another arterial cannula in the subclavian artery. Am I right? Uh, I I would insert. I would begin with the femoral femoral setting in the case of emergency, and as soon as it's stabilized, I would uh, insert the cannula there, and of course remove the other one from the femoral artery. Okay. Uh, Exactly. I, I usually used uh, one more technique or a different technique in uh, in this uh, differential hypoxia or Harlequin syndrome due to the watershed the phenomenon. Whenever I have this Harlequin syndrome, what I do, I add another venous uh, 
cannula to the internal uh, jugular okay. and change the configuration to VAV. Okay. And actually, always that uh, helps my patient. But of course, your technique also is a, a very nice one. But of course, I mean, um, Professor Muhammad, as you have mentioned, that would be even more um, um, useful because you can do that also by by only uh, percutaneous uh, puncture. And and of course, the other one, the subclavian artery, requires a little bit of surgery. So, uh, well, that that's a nice uh, a nice solution, of course, having a VAV um, uh, condition. And and thank you very much for the comment because, as you can see, thinking of the ECMO as a flexible and a dynamic uh, process always brings you to also say, why not? go for another Canada and then overcome this. Yeah. That, that, that will take me to another comment about the, uh, the flexibility in, uh, in ECMO. ECMO is never that you put a VV ECMO, that means that we will continue. Especially in the lung transplant, um, in our practice in uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, we had a lot of experience and a change of paradigm of the lung transplant with the introduction of ECMO as a bridge to lung transplant or intraoperative. We are using it in 70 to 80 percent of our patients intraoperative um, in the lung transplant or post lung transplant in case of severe primary grab dysfunction uh, grade three. We uh, put most not post, but we had uh, our series. 24 percent of our series okay. had. Uh, uh, severe primary graft dysfunction, and we had to insert for them post-operative uh, ECMO uh, with excellent results. So ECMO really changed the paradigm of lung transplant, changed uh, the results of lung transplant. One more thing also uh, for the Avalon cannula ins uh, insertion, mm -hmm. you mentioned that always we have to put the transosophial echo to confirm the direction of the flow to, toward the tricuspid valve. Exactly. One more thing, always put a fluoroscopy during the insertion to confirm that my guide wire is going to the inferior vena cava. Exactly. Personally, because... I saw an RV yeah. uh, ruptured before with the Avalon cannula, so I yeah. always prefer and I always tell my colleagues and my trainees never insert an Avalon cannula without a fluoroscopy and seeing your guide wire going distal in the uh, inferior vena cava. This is a very valuable comment. And as I say, Professor Muhammad, when you when you uh, really, uh, you know, uh, take care at, or take attention of these pitfalls, you never get problem because many people have some problems with ECMO. They, they think it's really a, a dangerous thing. It would be, but if you take care of these pitfalls, it's, it's, it's always safe. But for, for me, do you perform actually a clamshell or would you go for um, uh, both anterolaterally uh, located uh, incisions oh, while I, transplanting? I use... A single port lung transplant. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, no, we, we do that, the clamshell. And, <laughs> and, and we call it minimal invasive single port lung transplant. Yes, yes. Okay. It is a single port. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Bassam, one more time. And I will open the floor to, uh, for my colleagues for any questions or discussion. مساء الخيرات زملاء شكرا جزيلا على هالمحاضرة القيمة الحقيقة مع هاي تكنيك في جراحة الصدر للحالات المعقدة واللي هي أحيانا ما بنعملها لأنه ما في هالأجهزة هاي اللي ذكرتوها اللي سؤال إذا سمحتوا دكتور بسام ودكتور محمد وقت بتوصلوا المريض على هذه الأجهزة وبنعمل العملية شو شو المشكلة بالنسبة هذا المريض حم يأخذ هبارين هل في مشكلة من النزف أثناء أو بعد العمل الجراحي على العمليات اللي بنعملها كيف تدبروا هذا الموضوع وشكرا That's a very nice question دكتور بسام بسام درويش يا اهلا وسهلا يا دكتور بسام واهلا وسهلا باخواننا في سوريا كلهم اذا سمحت لي يا دكتور بسام رضوان ارد Actually, uh, your question is very valid and very important. And actually, this is one of the biggest advantages of ECMO. In the past days, right before 2013, uh, most of the centers around the world, we were using cardiopulmonary bypass if we need a support for the patient intraoperative. طبعا كلنا عارفين cardio pulmonary bypass احنا بندي 300 units of heparin and we need to reach uh, ACT of 300 to 350. However, to see the advantage of ECMO, in ECMO we give only 50 units per kg for our uh, recipient and our advantage uh, uh, and our goal is to reach 160 to 180 
ACT uh, or seconds in the um, activating uh, clotting time. So actually we are giving only 15% of the amount of heparin. So the risk of uh, bleeding is much lesser with the ECMO uh, when compared to the cardiopulmonary bypass. And this is one of the biggest the biggest advantage in addition to the advantage of lesser inflammatory reaction also in the ECMO when compared to the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Absolutely agree with Professor Mohammed. And sometimes we even, uh, if it's only for surgery, if it's only for uh, an oncological surgical uh, procedure, I actually only give 2000 heparin uh, for, for the implanting and then give anything else. So uh, it, it's, it's only for like two hours. You just perform your surgery, take out the ECMO and that's it. And yeah. in, in like in, in like in, in trauma patients, we know that we can insert ECMO without any heparinization, and it also worked as well. So this is the big advantage, Professor Mohammed just uh, told us, and it's really a nice, a nice form. Shukran, shukran. Doctor Mahmoud Hashim, تفضل. السلام عليكم دكتور محمد. Dr. Bassam, a very nice talk. Thank you for uh, for the talk. Uh, it's very important topic and a very nice approach for presentation. Uh, my question actually is about the um, the paracorporeal uh, support, the PA uh, lift atrium uh, connection. Uh, it's about which patient? Which I mean, you mentioned it's in case of uh, RV failure accompanied with pulmonary hypertension. Exactly. But which patient you elect to? You mentioned it's an open technique. Uh, we need to open the chest to put such a cannula. So which patient you elect to do this kind of support for him? Well, um, the, the paracorporeal is really only for, um, I mean, in, in, in my practice, was only the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hypertension patients with a severe uh, gradient uh, suffering also from a right ventricular failure. So that, that would be the indication for uh, um, open surgically implant the uh, cannula. Uh, when I perform uh, a, a transternal pneumonectomy, uh, you know, I think to myself, I'm, I'm already there. So uh, I insert my venous cannula at the femoral vein. And when I'm, when I'm in front of the atrium, I get the other cannula into the atrium. So it's, it's actually only a matter of, uh, of, of, of relaxing to the surgeon, because if you're familiar with the cardiopulmonary bypass and you have performed that as well. So, um, you know, that inserting the cannula into the left atrium is not that big deal. So you just go for it, but you can also still I'm make that as well. And in, in, in the pediatric patients, of course, uh, you always open the chest for ECMO. So um, that's actually only the two indications I would open the chest for an ECMO. Uh, otherwise, it's it's all percutaneous in, in, in commonly. I'm, I'm just asking this because we have a lot of cases of pulmonary hypertension that we elect usually to, to sometimes to bridge them with, with, uh, with the ECMO. And of course, you know, the sitting of, of um, doing this patient is critical and uh, quite challenging. Uh, it seems a uh, tempting uh, solution to just put a PA uh, and the right atrial and left atrial cannula. However, of course, uh, this will limit their mobilization. That's why I was asking for this the, particular the, patient. They, they are mobilized. Uh, I, you can mobilize them, actually. I have the picture, which I'm not showing here, of a patient sitting also with her membrane and mobilized, but you just have to make sure that she does not or he does not have um, any accompanying left heart failure, because in this case, you need to go for a venous arterial ECMO, of course, or just as Professor Mohammed mentioned, a venous arterial venous ECMO. That would be also a better option in this case, but... Uh, it's, it's not uh, disabling the mobility. They can actually also um, uh, walk with this device. Okay, thank you. Uh, shukran, Dr. Mahmoud. And I would like to mention, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hashim, I am in, uh, one of the main surgeons in the lung transplant program in King Faisal Specialist Hospital with an excellent uh, experience of uh, ECMO in the three stages of the lung transplant, bridging and intraoperative and postoperative. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hashim, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Really appreciating. Thank you. Thank you all. So can you share more experience in pediatric pulmonary? I'll have to say um, at our department, we only perform adult uh, transplantation. I'm, I'm really sorry to not be able to share anything of that. Perhaps Professor Mohammed, I don't know if you had some pediatric patients, but um, we only had uh, adults uh, in, in, in pulmonary uh, transplantation. So uh, I have... Our experience in, in pediatric patients with ECMO is... Uh, the experience actually in the lung transplant only, 
uh, and it was in King Faisal اللي انا اتشرفت يعني ان انا اشتغلت فيها for the last uh, uh, 12 years uh, and the last few years as a program director there uh, as well as some experience in Montreal University in, uh, in Canada in the pediatric lung transplant so the total was about 35 cases of lung transplant in between uh, both um, in most of the cases we used intraoperative ECMO no, no one of the pediatric lung transplant was uh, bridged except a single female patient she was 14 years old cystic fibrosis with severe uh, pre-op respiratory failure and she was bridged only for four days to uh, lung transplant and actually she had severe primary gra uh, graft dysfunction post-operative and also she needed some uh, about five days of post-operative uh, venous venous ECMO till the lungs uh, refunction but most of the cases of the pediatric Uh, lung transplant patients, we need to put them intraoperative on <coughs> venovenous ECMO and uh, the need for venovenous ECMO or venoarterial ECMO in the post-operative period for severe primary graft dysfunction usually in pediatric is much lesser than the adults. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. طيب uh, one last comment الحقيقه بما ان احنا في الـ, في الـ Arabian Society of uh, Thoracic Surgery that actually the extracorporeal life support and the ECMO يمكن الاكمو هي most popular between us uh, is very uh, minimally utilized in uh, Arabian countries unfortunately each one of us in his country needs to invest more time and invest in more training for himself and for his young staff also to uh, expand the idea and the uh, technique of ECMO in our Arabian countries it's life saving It's very helpful for many patients, even outside the lung transplant. In complicated cases, like uh, Dr. Bassam showed us, sometimes you cannot do these cases safely without uh, an ECMO venovenous or veno arterial. Wherever there is a program of lung transplant, and unfortunately, it's not very common also in Arabian countries, the ECMO is a mainstay of the lung transplant program. Now we have a very good lung transplant program طبعا في المملكه العربيه السعوديه في الرياض we have another uh, good lung transplant program Cleveland Clinic uh, Abu Dhabi وان شاء الله قريبا نبدا في جامعه عين شمس في القاهره باذن الله It's about the dilemma of uh, choosing the patient uh, for for bridging I mean Dr. Bassam mentioned one of the patient uh, with the um, advanced uh, emphysema and uh, he is I, i guess 59 years old and they elected to put an ecmo i don't know if the i mean as per the presentation they investigated him more after the uh, life support so the dilemma of putting an ecmo knowing that we might not have a a, a, a surgery to be done or or the uh, they already um, answered this question prior to put the ecmo because this is always for us uh, you know sir uh, a challenging uh, decision is to do uh, to put the ecmo and bridge the patient or or not um this is uh, w one thing i i uh, really like to to know the, th the the second comment i want to add i guess the ecmo also is adding and you attended her in, in king faisal and we all shared the the, the knowledge of uh, of doing some cases uh, on ecmo for for minimally invasive like uh, if we are doing uh, bronchial resection uh, or extended bronchial resection to the crane doing that on on ECMO uh, to try to avoid uh, uh, cross uh, ventilation i guess this is also uh, one of the uh, incoming more uh, indication for using an ECMO during thoracic surgery thank you sir absolutely so uh, i i mostly I, i agree with you and it's always a, a question of it is a bridge to therapy or a destination therapy so Um, if if I if I know that the patient, uh, I mean there is this this recommendation patients uh, above 70 would not get an ECMO. But of course you need to take a look at the patient before. I mean ECMO comes from uh, from lung failure. So uh, and we had a lot of lung failures during during the COVID pandemic. So uh, if if you have a young patient with a really massive lung failure with a fibrosis, but he's 40, so um, you would still put him on ECMO probably. Uh, so the, if the patient is like 70 or 80. People here in Europe tend to get really old, so uh, you won't really think about an ECMO in an 80-year-old uh, person. But if it's like a 60-year-old guy, which is also very uh, vital, which was very healthy, and he gets a lung failure, um, I, I would go for it. You know, I, I would I would go for an ECMO. Uh, but we still 
we, we still do not have a similar device as the LVATs in the heart failure. There were some attempts to actually have ambulatory ECMO, but it's not, it's not still uh, done. So uh, I, I guess in the next five years, we will have something like an LVAT, but, but for the lung. Um, and to that time, then you get the decision, is this a bridge to therapy, a bridge to transplant, or a destination therapy? So uh, we will face the same thing we have in the cardiac failure, probably. And the second comment is, is actually very valuable in the way we see it as well. Also. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bassam, for the nice uh, answer. And thanks, Dr. Mahmoud, for the uh, excellent questions. Uh, one of the things uh, I would uh, like to mention also regarding the age. Yeah, always it's a very challenging decision to put a patient above 70 on ECMO or to transplant a patient above 70 for a lung transplant. But I was just, I would just uh, uh, share with you a nice experience we had in uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital where we transplanted a 74 years old guy, but his biological age was excellent. Mm -hmm. This guy was extubated on the second post-operative day, went to the floor on the fourth post-operative day, and he went home after two uh, weeks. So sometimes it, it goes uh, in a very nice uh, way if the patient is 74 or 75 in, and in a good shape and you don't have much young patients on your waiting list, give them a chance. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Ali Warda. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Mohammed. And Dr. Ali Warda Taban is our specialist uh, في, uh, in Shams University and uh, an excellent uh, young uh, surgeon. Uh, assistant lecturer of uh, cardiothoracic for Gamat and Shams. Thank you so much for the hosting, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Dr. Bassam, for the lecture. Thank you. Um, my, my question is just very simple. I'm just asking about the, um, the, the, the phenomenon that Dr. Mohammed just mentioned, the watershed phenomenon or the differential hypoxia. Um, I'm just asking about the, 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 how does it happen or why does it happen? That's my, my very simple question and, and thank you in advance. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, very mechanical and simple because uh, if, you got, <clears throat> if you got your venous, your arterial cannula in the, in the femoral artery, you get this retrograde uh, flow. So you get the highly oxygenated blood uh, after your ECMO circuit pumped towards uh, heart and, and brain. And you got the, you got the poorly oxygenated blood from the patient's uh, uh, genuine uh, circulation because he has the lung or heart failure. And these bloods, uh, both of these bloods meet at this watershed zone. And then you get this differentiated um, uh, oxygenation. So uh, just as Professor Mohammed mentioned, of course, it's really an elegant uh, way to overcome that is to make the blood come. By a VAV. Yeah, he just mentioned the VAV yeah. method. Yeah, and okay. uh, the way I did it before, um, uh, I after stabilizing the patient, I just moved the uh, arterial cannula from the femoral artery to the subclavian artery. But of course, it has uh, the patient has to be stable um, until that. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. What, one more thing I would like to uh, to add. You you mentioned it, Doctor Bassam, in your question, and I would like to uh, remind everyone of our uh, colleagues, uh, junior and senior, with it. In VA ECMO, when we put a femoral femoral uh, veno arterial ECMO, it's very important to start by putting the anti-grade cannula first uh, in the uh, limb. We usually put six French or five French cannula anti-grade. Then put your main uh, cannula, the retrograde in the femoral area. If you put first the uh, retrograde cannula, the main cannula, it will be very difficult for you to access the superficial femoral artery and put your anti-grade cannula. So my, my advice always to start with the anti-grade, if you are putting it subcutaneous or if you are putting it in, in an open technique, whatever, start with the anti-grade and then put your main cannula, if you agree with me, uh, Dr. Bassam. Very valuable comment, exactly. Those those tips are the things which 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 keep us alive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, any more questions? في سؤال يا فندم ما تتوب على الشات دكتور محمد. Did ECMO give more post-operative sepsis في حالات the infectious diseases من دكتور ماسين الحمومي. In my practice, I did not uh, observe any any increased uh, septical uh, episodes in infectious disease after using the ECMO. Of course, you have an inflammatory response. I did not uh, watch um, any any like uh, increased septical complications. I don't know, Professor Mohammed. Uh, no, not 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 really. Uh, always, when we put a patient on ECMO, whatever the kind of ECMO, 
uh, we will cover him well with uh, good antibiotics. We'll take cultures regularly. It's a part of the protocol of ECMO to take uh, blood cultures at least weekly. So uh, usually uh, not if the care is well. One of the parts of the success of ECMO program is the bedside nurse and the perfusionist and the ECMO specialist. These three should keep an eye on the uh, sites of ECMO. Some of the patients, they stay on ECMO for a few months. I saw three months, I saw four months, I saw five months on ECMO. The site of the cannulation should be uh, checked daily by the surgeon uh, or daily at least by the bedside nurse and the ECMO specialist and at least every two, three days by the surgeon. And as maybe Dr. Mahmoud Hashem remember in our protocol in King Faisal, every week we have to add a stitch to tie it well around the venous cannula and every week a stitch on the arterial cannula. So it's very important to watch that and to uh, to define if there is any uh, beginning of infection, to make a good dressing of the cannula. Um, so uh, the care is very important in in these cases. Absolutely. Patients get edema, for example. That's why I think of the stitch. Professor Mohammed mentioned as a, well, if you, if you really uh, are surprised how the cannula might be dislocated, if you don't take a look at it, and a stitch might be a life savior. هل الجهاز غالي؟ ده رقم واحد، رقم اتنين آه نقدر نوفر كوادر ازاي في معظم بلادنا العربيه متدربين كويس، حضرتك ذكرت دلوقتي ان في اكمو سبيشالست، يعني الديلي كير او ال 24 اور كير بيكون من خلال آه تكنيشيان متدرب بشكل جيد، يعني مش الفيزيشن او الدكتور هو اللي بيشرف على البرفيوجن اثناء تركيبه. فين الاماكن اللي نقدر ندرب فيها الناس؟ وقت التدريب قد ايه؟ وهل الجهاز غالي نقدر نحصله ولا لا مش عارف حضراتكم عندكم المعلومات السياسيه الاقتصاديه ديت ولا لا انا اقتصاديا ممكن اقول لك يا دكتور عامر اتفضل انا بس حاول الفلوس ودكتور محمد هيتكلم في الكلام السليم اتفضل <تصفيق> من عندنا في المانيا في هو في يعني شركتين هم اكتر شركتين بيعملوا الاكموس ممتازه جدا الشركه الثانيه يعني الكونزول نفسها في حوالي حسب انت الشركه عامل معاها يعني ديل ولا لا من 35 ل 50 الف يورو يعني حسب احنا عندنا عشان كان عندنا ديل كويس خدنا منهم اربع كنزول في مره واحده فكانت واحده تقريبا 30 الف او 50 الف الكانولاز اللي هي السنجل سايتس حوالي 800 يورو الكانولا او 400 حسب قد ايه يعني يعني فرنش وطبعا لما بتكون عندك الاكمو بتجيب كمان في العاده زي زي يعني جهاز بيسخن الدم عشان طبعا انت عندك جوار مجال بالظبط يعني او وارمر يعني ده كمان 8000 يورو فيعني ممكن مثلا تقول يعني 50 60000 يوروز يعني انفستمنت فور فور ون جود ديفايس طبعا دكتور محمد بقى هو اللي ممكن يقول لنا ال... يعني الاسعار انا كنت لسه بدربها كده لما احسبها بالجنيه المصري لان احنا لسه شاريين اكمو ديفايس عندنا في جامعه عين شمس اتس نيرلي ذا سيم سو الكونسول احنا كنا شاريين ال It was can beside have million guinea, which is around 40,000 euros. طبعا في عندنا في نوعين من الكيتس او من الاجهزه في عندنا الروتا فلو وفي في نوع ثاني معلش فكرني بيه الكارديو هيلب اه الكارديو هيلب الروتا فلو اكشوالي ثمنه از وان ثيرد الكارديو هيلب يا yeah. بس كان uh, حلو في الترانسبورت بقى كده بالظبط كده uh, that's why يعني مثلا احنا لما بنيجي نشتغل انترا اوبريتيف فور ذا لانج ترانسبلانت وي يوز ذا روتا فلو روتا فلو لان ده ات ويل ات ويل سيف 70% hmm. ولكن لو المريض هيطلع بره على بوست اوبريتيف فينو فيناس اكمو وانا متوقع انها تبقى طويله شويه وي بريفير ذا كارديو هيلب هاويفر روتا فلو كان سيرف فور 10 days of post-operative venous venous ECMO at ease with one third of the uh, of the price. دي حاجة. بالنسبة بقى للتريننج. الحقيقة أنا I suggest and advise all my colleagues في ECMO كورس ممتاز بيتعامل في Hôpital Pitié Salpetier في في باريس. الECMO كورس ده is three days course وفي one day hands on. An excellent course. It's a bit uh, expensive, but this is an expense, uh, an excellent course and a state of the art for uh, the ECMO. If we entered all of us on the extra uh, uh, corporeal life support organization, the ELZO, 
<تصفيق> they perform and they conduct many courses uh, لكن في رأيي the best is the ECMO course in hospital um, uh, PTA Sal PTR في uh, باريس بالنسبة لدولنا العربية احنا بدأنا نعمل uh, small ECMO course كده على قدنا في مصر عملنا a couple of courses في uh, جامعة عين شمس وان شاء الله هنكمل فيها في برضو اتم كورس ممتاز بيعملوه في جامعه القاهره في وحده الدكتور شريف مختار الاتم كورس دوت انا بشجع الناس كلها سواء الاطباء النيرسز اتم سبيشالست البرفيوجنست ذي شود اتند ذا سؤالك يا عامر برضو از فيري امبورتنت الخاص بالاكمو سبيشالست الاكمو سبيشالست والبرفيوجنست ذي ار نيرسز بياخدوا كورسز وبيتعلموا كويس في على موضوع الاكمو اند They are the mainstay of the ECMO program. تمام يا فندم، شكرا جزيلا لحضرتك دكتور محمد. أنا I think إن عامر لما سأل على الأسعار يسأل على أسعار الأكسسوارز الـ الديسبوزبل الديسبوزبل يعني أنا بشتري هي الـ الممبرين أنا دكتور عامر الممبرين حسب حضرتك بتاخد أني أني واحدة بس في العادة بتروح أسعارها ما بين 2500 ل 3000 يورو عندنا يعني في في المكي هو اخذت حضرتك تاخد الاتش ال اس بروفيسور محمد مش كده الاتش ال اس ميمبر الازرق على الاغلب يعني بالظبط كده فهو من 3000 تقريبا 3000 يورو والكانيولاس يعني 800 او او 600 يورو حسب الفرنش وفي الدايلاتر سيتس اللي هي اللي بتكون موجوده يعني حوالي 150 يورو او حاجه زي كده يعني انت ممكن تعمل مثلا Like 5,000 euros uh, the possible in the Actually, it's at the same prices in the Middle East, yeah. so in the Master or in the Arab Saudi Arabia, it was the same prices. I think that was the important question, but I bought the console a few times. I just have a question for the complication of the thrombosis of veins. How to deal with and is it wise to insert the inferior vena cava filter in some cases or not? هي بالنسبه لل لل thrombosis of uh, of the veins yeah it can uh, it can happen however with a proper uh, anticoagulation بلا افراط ولا تفريط it's very important uh, we we are not uh, aiming for an uh, ACT of 250 or 300 وفي نفس الوقت keeping the uh, ECMO running for a long time Uh, without heparin, it can uh, occur, and we can, uh, sometimes we do it. However, لو ال patient تاعي has has uh, is is not having a high risk of bleeding, it's always better to keep the veno venous ECMO in between 160 to 180 ACT, the veno arterial ECMO in between 180 to 200 uh, ACT, or whatever protocol اللي عندك في ال في المستشفى. لكن actually it's not systematic, and I never had it in in my career uh, to place. Uh, uh, inferior vena cava filter for uh, for that. Dr. Bassam, برضو لو يحب يضيف حاجة. بالضبط أنا مع فصل محمد نفس الحكاية إن عمري ما ما تلاقيت أحط أي فلتر وزي ما قلت عندنا إحنا مثلاً من دائما أسبرين يعني لل لل لما يكون في إس إس إل إس وطبعاً ده هتبقى تشوف الممبرين نفسها بتبص عليها بال بالنور الموبايل او حاجه عشان تشوف لو عليها ثرومبوزز وطبعا تعمل كده كده تيست ممكن مثلا تاخد البروجر اناليسيس ما بعد الممبرين وتشوف لو لسه مثلا لما تحطها في العربي يكون البي او 2 لايك 3 تو 400 يعني فلما تلاقي فجاه ان هو بقى مثلا 100 ولا 150 هتعرف ان الممبرين ابتدت حبه حبه يعني وظيفتها تقل يعني فممكن نغير الممبرين بكل بساطه يعني بس ما اضطريناش ابدا نحط حاجه في الفينا كافا عشان ال Because uh, يعني our group of patients are selected, you know, selected for thoracic uh, surgery. But if you is uh, ECMO is applied for trauma cases or for uh, pulmonary embolism or something like this, in some cases of trauma cases, يعني the, the risk of um, of uh, thrombosis is high. Uh, of course. And it, it's always you have to measure. It's uh, how is the risk of bleeding and thrombosis. So if thrombosis is higher. You go for the anticoagulation. I, I, we use uh, agatroban. It's it's in, in my practice, it's better than heparin. But uh, you know, everybody ha- has his uh, habits, and uh, I, I I'm using agatroban for the like last six years, and never had any any serious thrombosis of of the of the membrane or of the cannula. Wow. Isn't it very expensive, the agatroban, Doctor Bassam? I remember it was very expensive, and that's why. <laughs> يعني احنا بنروح لها الارجوتروبان يوجوالي اف ذا بيشنت از هافينج هيت هيت اكزاكتلي لكن ار يو يوزنج ات سيستماتيكلي 
in, in ECLS, always Agat Oban, actually. It's, um, yani, since we, be, we, be, we have begun with Agat Oban, it's, uh, I, I observed a lot less complications, thrombobolic complications with, uh, with the ECMO. So, uh, well, That's very good uh, information to add. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you remember, Dr. Mohammed, I just want to, to say about this, uh, the, the nature of the cannulation and the circuit used in ECMO is, is quite different than the uh, used in uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. You remember we have this dilemma in, in King Faisal before that we need to have the heparinized the cannula. I mean, the cannulas that you usually use for the cardiopulmonary bypass, sometimes it comes uh, not heparinized. We depend on the full heparinization of the patient, which is a different case than the ECMO. So it's it's necessary to emphasize that the cannulas and the, the whole circuit is heparin coated, which is different usually than the um, the one used in cardiopulmonary bypass. Perfect, completely. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, actually, in King Faisal, we didn't have these cannulas, and we had some uh, some cases of clotting or uh, thrombosis. But when we started to use this uh, heparinized cannula for uh, central cannulation, uh, that the, all these complications diminished uh, significantly. However, the peripheral cannulas are all the, the peripheral cannulas in the market are all uh, heparinized. The problem is always in the central cannulation. So you need uh, this is a very good comment. Uh, Whenever you ha you are in a center doing central ECMO from time to time, it's always better to to buy the heparinized central ECMO cannulas. Thanks, uh, Mahmoud. In CTA patient, uh, which patient which we are having thrombophilic patients, we put uh, IVC filter regularly here. Thrombo uh, thrombophilic patient with uh, CTA, we put IVC filter with ECMO. Uh, good results. Uh, we did not see any filter getting obstructed. And after three months, mm. we remove uh, electively. Okay, well, well CTA is, of course, um, a case of, of, of higher uh thromboembolic um uh happenings uh, so it, it will be it will be probably also very uh good to, to do that but i guess in the usual cases um handling uh ecmo it's, it's not that necessary but of course in, in case of ctef you have a systemic higher uh, thromboembolic potential which is then uh, a very good reason putting this uh this cable um and last personal question to all seniors uh which case you don't want to put the patient on ecmo and your logic on that reason. So let me start. So uh, we put uh, our patients on ECMO if they need it. So your question is very uh, nice question and it's very deep. So uh, whenever the patient needs ECMO, we have to put him on ECMO. Uh, for example, I will go again to our uh, the, the, the more experience in lung transplant. Many of the patients in King Faisal, for example, we were doing about 30% of our patients without any support. So if the patient can't tolerate doing the lung transplant without any support, we don't uh, put it. Still, the ECMO, you have cannulation site, you have to give heparin and all of that. And it's always benefit risk. So if the patient can't tolerate that I do for him the lung transplant without putting him on ECMO, I will do him without putting him on ECMO. However... If the patient, I know preoperative that the patient is having pulmonary hypertension, that the patient, his lungs are completely destroyed, he will never tolerate a single lung ventilation. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, putting stents, uh, I know that his heart is not uh, that good, the ejection fraction is low, I will electively go for a central ECMO, ECMO cannulation so that I'll be happy, I can manipulate the heart, Anesthesia will be happy and the patient will be well perfused the whole procedure. Intraoperative in surgical cases uh, like these uh, interesting cases uh, Dr. Bassam showed us, uh, if the patient cannot tolerate again uh, single lung ventilation or there will be risks in single lung ventilation, it's always better, better to put the patient on venovenous ECMO, which is very safe and very convenient uh, to you as a surgeon, to the anesthesia and to the patient also. Dr. Bassam. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Very valuable comment. And uh, I always say the best patient with the ECMO is the one without ECMO, just throw it So uh, yeah, yeah. When, when, when we perform surgeries uh, uh, other than uh, lung transplant, uh, we always uh, go for the single lung ventilation. And if it's not well tolerated, if we see, okay, he gets hypercapnic, hypoxic, then we go for the ECMO. But of course, if it's well tolerated, or if we see, okay, it's, 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 a, it's a quick procedure, I don't know, it's like... Uh, 
a left lower lobe. You can take the left lower lobe in like 30 minutes out. So you go, okay, come on, 30 minutes, I'm going to do it without any ECMO. But if it's, it's something with reconstructive surgery where you need an anastomosis and you know the patient needs a good anastomosis to survive, so you go for the ECMO. So just as Professor Muhammad mentioned, it's always advantage advantage and you just have to, you know, you get a feeling of the patient, you talk to your patient and and then you can you can know, all right, this this one, I will go for it. And the other one, I guess it's not a good option. So I guess it's a, a lot of uh, also your personal uh, experience and feeling of the patient, uh, if it's sorry or not. Uh, Dr. Aymar has a, a question. When pulmonologists decide to refer uh, a patient for ECMO? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, uh, pulmonologists uh, re- refer that if, um, I mean, at our hospital, for example, um, in case of um, IRDS, as I started in my, my last hospital now, they always considered ECMO at the very late stage when it's a severe IRDS according to the Berlin definition. But I always tell them, we do not have to wait until it's deteriorating and then say, okay, now we go for ECMO. We can still put the ECMO on an earlier stage to enable the protective uh, um, um, lung ventilation. So um, the pulmonologist usually at our hospital pref- uh, refer to us if they got a patient with RDS, if they got a patient with um, with actually um, uh, an exacerbation of, uh, of a COPD, for example, with a hypercapnic uh, failure. So uh, instead of going for uh, ventilation or mechanical ventilation, we go for a low flow um, twin port uh, single side cannulation, for example, to just uh, recover this, this phase and then uh, the exacerbation is, is 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 treated, and the patient is is also the normal on his normal lift device, for example. So uh, it's it's always regarding the respiratory failure at our hospital, of course. And if you got a transplant unit, you got more referrals, of course, because patients do deteriorate on the waiting list. COVID era made the ECMO very popular everywhere uh, in the world, and it made a lot of pulmonologists start to read more and more on, uh, about the ECMO, start uh, to refer more and more patients to ECMO. And as Dr. Bassam mentioned, the, the key of success of the ECMO uh, patient and the key to better survival after ECMO is the early referral and the timely insertion of ECMO. In the 1990s, I remember I was just a small trainee. In the 1990s, we were always telling that the ECMO is a one-way ticket. Most of the patients, <laughs> almost all of the patients, you put them on ECMO and they die. But mm-hmm. we were putting the patients on ECMO at that time while they are dying, actually. Mm-hmm. So no one was surviving after ECMO. However, now, when we see our results, very difficult patients who had severe primary gra- uh, graft dysfunction, post-lung transplant with 90% one-year survival, we know that early insertion of ECMO is a great privilege for the patient. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, during, uh, not necessarily in your experience, but uh, from the literature, do you read about uh, applying two ECMOs in a single patient when one ECMO cannot correct the blood gases? Well, uh, the, the guys in Toronto published a very nice uh, a very nice case that was uh, Mark De Perot and uh, and uh, Saipero, uh, which I also happened to work with. Uh, they had this patient with uh, with some kind of a very septic um, uh, disease of both lungs, having like multiple abscesses in all of the lungs, and they ta- they actually uh, performed uh, a bilateral pneumonectomy and then had an in serial ECMO circuit, uh, actually two consoles. And after six days, I guess, they performed a double lung transplant and the patient survived. So uh, I guess that would be the only case I think about where two where two ECMOs are necessary. But in, in usual practice, I, I can't say anything about two ones being necessary. I don't know, Professor Muhammad, perhaps uh, you got an idea on that? Uh, no, uh, actually, I, I, ne- I never uh, heard about uh, applying uh, two ECMOs. Of course, I read the paper. One paper before that they removed the lungs, and at that time they were putting one ECMO only. But I didn't re- uh, read uh, the paper uh, putting a couple of ECMOs in a single patient. So it was bilateral veno-arterial ECMO, uh, femoral-femoral, or what? I I, I, I don't want to. I'm going to send that to the group. But uh, I guess it, one was a veno-venous, and the other one was central, as I rec- as I recall. And uh, on that, that was a very cool uh, construction. I'm gonna I'm gonna send the paper in our in our group. I'll just uh, I'll just search for it after our our talk and 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 send it to all the colleagues. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, we have Doctor Islam uh, Saada. 
who is mentioning we did two ECMO many times. Dr. Islam, can you elaborate more about it? Yes, we um, in our center, we are the performing ECMO routinely for uh, patients with, uh, with ERGS or uh, post-cardiac arrest or um, either VA or VV. We have series of cases, We uh, either to, as Dr. Bassam said, we have uh, uh, barrel console or uh, and run. We can use um, like drainage from one femoral vein and returning to right internal jugular, or um, as the other one, uh, draining from left femoral vein and draining to left internal jugular. Other patients, we can uh, use uh, the other console as um, augmenting the oxygenation. You can take the return line as a drainage line to the other console. So we did it uh, for a very sick patient during COVID period, and the uh, result was uh, like a 30% uh, improvement, but it is uh, not so uh, impressive, but uh, it can work. Uh, we did also one case of uh, separate VA and uh, separate VV, and one uh, patient was severe uh, septic shock. Very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Your uh, your presentation was great to the to the extent that we uh, we are discussing questions now for more than forty five minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Bassam, and thanks, uh, Dr. Amir, for the uh, organization. Thanks for uh, our colleagues for the very nice uh, questions and the great uh, participation today. I think it was very great participation. And inshallah, it can uh, be uh, a beginning uh, to spread the knowledge of ECMO in our uh, Arabian countries. Yes, we need to spread the uh, culture of ECMO in our, uh, our centers. وبالتوفيق للجميع شكرا مره ثانيه يا دكتور بسام شكرا مره ثانيه يا دكتور محمد شكرا دكتور شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمد شكرا لحضرتك دكتور بسام شكرا للحضور الكريم يعني النهايه بتاعت دكتور محمد قال يعني ايه نرجو نشر الفكره لا يا فندم ده احنا هنكلف حضرتك بعد كده لما الجمعيه ان شاء الله تتم ان حضرتك يعني ايه تفتح لنا كده تريننج سنتر عن الاكمو وما فيش داعي نسافر فرنسا والكلام ده تمام ان شاء الله يعني اه يكون لحضرتك دور ودكتور بسام والساده الكرام اللي هم الحمد لله اول تريند ان احنا نبدا نشتغل احنا ستاند الون ارب سوراسيك سيرجن باذن الله اوفل ان شاء الله دكتور عامر رخصوا لنا السعر شوي كمان احنا نقدر نطبق كمان ان شاء الله احنا ممكن اه صحيح صحيح استاذنا الدكتور بسام هم فعلا لو احنا عملنا صفقه عربيه يعني مثلا 10 اجازه مره واحده لا ممكن يعملوا 50% ديسكاونت اقل حاجه شكرا 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 لزملائنا على الحقيقه المحاضره والنقاش الجيد جدا جميل عالي مستوى جزاكم الله خير تصبحون على خير حضرتك طيب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك